If you've ever watched a heist movie, you probably remember the part where the characters come up with an ingenious complex plan to break into the vault. But how easy is it in real life? Is it even possible? Well, be sure to watch to the end, cause what you learn might surprise you. First, let's talk about how vault technology developed. People have always wanted to keep their valuables safe and secure. Box and safes have been in use for millennia. The oldest locks we know of were made in ancient Egypt, and the technology was developed and improved throughout the ancient world in places like Rome, India, and China, where the combination lock is thought to have been invented. Until the mid to late 1800s, many banks in the United States and elsewhere stored money and valuables in heavy iron safes, with a simple lock that could be opened with a key. Unfortunately, these safes were not very secure. Not only could they be opened with simple tools like hammers and picks, they were usually small enough that determined thieves could take them right out of the building and open them in a safe location at their leisure. In response, the makers of safes began making them heavier and sturdier, more difficult to move or break open. Would-be thieves soon found a way to deal with the heavier safes, putting explosives in the keyhole and simply blasting them open. Manufacturers continued to try new ways to make their safes more secure, and the technology evolved in a kind of arms race with bank robbers. When thieves came up with a technique to exploit weaknesses in a safe, the makers came up with a new design that prevented it. Then the thieves would find a new weakness, and the cycle would go on and on. In the mid-1800s, the modern combination lock became popular. This eliminated the key and the need for a keyhole, instead utilizing a relatively more complex lock that required a specific combination to open. Thieves soon found ways to open safes with combination locks. One way was using force to punch the lock through the back of the door, destroying the lock and allowing the safe to be opened. A more refined technique involved drilling holes in the door and using mirrors to view the interior of the lock, allowing the thief to easily see how to open the lock. Many bank robbers opted to go the simplest route and simply kidnapped the bank manager in the night, forcing him to give up the combination. Kidnappings were rendered useless when James Sargent introduced his theft-proof lock, a combination lock with a timer that kept the safe from being opened for a set number of hours after being closed. However, it did nothing to stop thieves from opening the safe with force or explosives. The locking mechanism wasn't the only thing that changed over time. Safe manufacturers tried to correct weaknesses in other parts of the safe, like the door. A safe could often be opened by forcing a gap between the door and frame and filling it with explosives, like gunpowder, which would blast the door wide open. Manufacturers attempted to correct this by building the doors and frame with a pattern of grooves that prevented the insertion of any tool deep enough to force a crack, but criminals are a creative bunch. They started boiling dynamite in water and skimming the liquid nitroglycerin off the top. The volatile liquid would be poured into the grooves and then heated. The resulting explosion never failed to destroy the door. The next step for safe makers was to redesign the door to be like a tapered plug, fitting so snugly into the frame that there was no room for anything between them. In the 1900s, most banks switched from safes to heavy vaults, which were built as part of the bank building itself. The vaults had incredibly thick walls of concrete reinforced with steel, designed to withstand natural disasters, damage to the surrounding building, and the best efforts of would-be bank robbers. In fact, the concrete used in bank vaults is so strong it is known to withstand nuclear explosions. In World War II at the Taikoku Bank in Hiroshima, the two bank vaults survived the blast and the contents were undamaged. Though bank vaults were much too strong to be vulnerable to hammers, picks, or explosives, they could still be breached by equipment like cutting torches. To counter this, manufacturers began putting copper plates in the doors. Copper is an excellent conductor and caused the heat from the torches to dissipate without damaging the door. In the end, the vault manufacturers came out on top, mostly. Today's vaults are so durable that bank robberies are not not usually the problem they once were, but special tools like thermal lenses can be used to penetrate a vault and gain access to its contents. And as some especially clever criminals have proven, there are other ways to break into a vault, but I'll get to that later. In modern banks, the vault is normally the first part to be built, and the rest of the building is built around it. The special concrete in the walls is so thick it has to be molded instead of poured, and steel rods are inserted into the wet concrete to support the walls once they dry, along with additives like metal shape that make the concrete harder to drill through. The mixture is vibrated continuously for several hours to ensure there are no air bubbles in the finished wall, which is typically several feet thick. The door is secured by large metal rods that extend into the frame when locked. 
the locking mechanism is always on the inside of the door, where it cannot be accessed from outside, and there are usually additional layers of security, like heater motion detectors. So how could anyone break into a vault like that? You might want to ask the crew that broke into the Antwerp Diamond Center vault in 2003. A five-man crew, including a master locksmith and a specialist in electron alarm systems, all led by experienced thief Leonardo Nortar Bartolo, broke into the vault in the middle of the night and stole over $100 million in diamonds and other valuables, doing such an expert job that police were flummoxed as to how they had entered the building, much less the state-of-the-art vault, equipped with a combination heat and motion detector, Doppler radar, a magnetic field, a lock with over 100 million possible combinations, and a nearly impossible to duplicate foot-long key. How this feat was accomplished remained a mystery until 2009 when Notar Bartolo gave a prison interview in which he told the story for the first time. For months beforehand, he had been renting an office in the building and posing as a diamond merchant, which gave him a good cover as well as access to the vault, allowing him to study it in detail and take hidden camera footage of the vault being unlocked so they'd know the combination. One of the crew, a master locksmith, used footage of the long key to make a copy. Before the crew attempted the actual robbery, an exact replica of the vault was built in an old warehouse, allowing them to practice every move. The day before the heist, Notar Bartolo visited his safety deposit box in the vault. While he was there, he cleverly sprayed women's hairspray on the heat and motion detector. The oil would insulate the sensor and keep it from detecting them right away, but it wouldn't last long. They'd have to move quickly to disable the alarm once they broke in. That night, they entered the Diamond Center by way of an old office building that shared a private garden with the back of the center. They used a homemade polyester shield to mask their body heat long enough to disable the alarm and entered the second floor of the Diamond Center. The vault was below ground level. They silently sneaked down to the antechamber, covered the security cameras with black plastic bags, and turned on the lights. Remember the magnetic field I mentioned? That was generated by two metal plates that sat side by side when the vault door was closed. If the door was open, the field would be broken and an alarm would be triggered. The thieves came up with an ingenious solution to this problem. They took a piece of stiff aluminum and covered one side in strong double-sided tape. They stuck this to the metal plates and loosened the bolts which held them to the door, simply moving them out of the way. Now the door could be opened without breaking the magnetic field. It turned out they didn't need the duplicate key. They had seen on their footage that the original was kept in an unlocked utility room near the vault. Talk about a security lapse. They entered the correct combination and turned the lights off again to avoid triggering the light detectors inside the vault before swinging the door open. Their long practice paid off. They knew exactly where to walk and which ceiling panel to open to access the main wires for the sensors. The sensors couldn't be simply disabled because they were all connected on a circuit. An electric pulse was sent out on one wire through each sensor in the circuit and finally back along the other wire. If any of the sensors along the way were disabled, the circuit would be broken, the signal would not return, and the alarm would be triggered. The crew's solution was yet another stroke of genius. They stripped the plastic from the two main wires and clipped a new piece of wire between them like a bridge, rerouting the circuit so it never reached the sensors. Essentially, that meant it no longer mattered if they tripped the sensors because they were no longer in the circuit. Getting into the safety deposit boxes was as easy as using a hand crank drill to break the locks. One by one, they flicked flashlights on just long enough to find the keyholes, broke the deposit boxes open, and then emptied the contents into duffel bags. They were in and out without anyone knowing they were there. It was the perfect heist. Well, almost perfect. Even though everything went according to plan, they still got caught. How could that happen? One of the crew had a panic attack and scattered incriminating trash in the woods instead of burning it, like they should have done. The trash was found by the property owner who called the police. They found envelopes from the Antwerp Diamond Center as well as several items directly tied to members of the crew. So after executing the perfect robbery, they went to prison anyway but they're still remembered as a textbook case for the right way to break into a high security vault, and many of the stolen diamonds have not been recovered. All that loot is still out there somewhere, waiting for Leonardo Norta Bartolo and his pals to get out of prison. So what's the trick to breaking into the world's strongest vault? Well, every vault is a little different, so there's no one right way to do it. Here are a few pointers, however. First, forget about drilling or tunneling in. 
you'll need to use the door on a modern vault. Be prepared. Make sure you know everything about the building and the best way to disable the security system. But be careful. Simply knocking out the sensors and opening the door will probably set off the alarm. You'll have to think outside the box, like spraying hairspray on the heat sensors or rerouting the alarm circuit. Find out the combination ahead of time. Next, practice. Know the layout of the vault. Make sure you have a plan and everything you need to pull it off. Having someone on the crew like a master locksmith or someone with experience dealing with alarm systems can't hurt either. In any case, you're unlikely to pull it off by yourself. Make sure you have a way to open the more conventional locks on the safe deposit boxes. Work fast, make a clean getaway, and make sure to remember to burn all your garbage. If you enjoyed this video, then why not subscribe? Hit that bell icon as well so you're more likely to get notified of our noble answers to your burning questions. Also, if you have any questions you want answered, make sure to tell me in the comments section down below. And to keep filling your brain with regal knowledge, check out these videos here. They're magnificent.